Uh, thank you very much for that, Josh. Uh, my name is Patrick Cuba. I'm here with Brian. Uh, we are the uh, developer team at Walter J. Ong SJ Center for Digital Humanities. Uh, you've probably seen Brian around a lot with maps. Uh, my role at, at the Ong Center is as the IT architect. Uh, I think Brian's title, I'll look it up here, full stack developer. Uh, that's the everything else. And so what we are working towards here is to show you uh, how we've built our triple IF aware ecosystem. And we say triple IF aware specifically because we're not trying to do the things that some of the very large uh, vendors can do or the very large organizations that uh, have the resources to create some of the amazing things that you've seen in other sessions here. Uh, we're looking at how can we build on each little thing that we've done and use standards as the way of interoperability even within our own collections and resources and the things that we're doing so that each project can move us a little bit further. Uh, in the spirit of uh, show don't tell, we're going to spend a bulk of this actually on some of the smaller projects, including many that are still in the works. Uh, so you will see a lot of things with the skin pulled off today. And uh, hopefully that is uh, something that will be very useful for you, especially if you're somebody who's trying to start your own project and, and work up the guts to uh, to start something with too few resources, uh, or maybe you have a really great idea and you're not sure how to get started with it, this might give you uh, an option where you can sort of uh, uh, enter a bit higher uh, and over a few obstacles that you started with. Uh, we're also very uh, lucky here, uh, in case between Brian and I, if you get tired of uh, you know white guys with beards and regional accents talking to you, uh, we do have some of the fantastic researchers and scholars that we've been working with. Uh, in the uh, chat and in the community, and they may join in uh, later when we get into the discussion. Uh, some of the things that will highlight the projects uh, that will highlight that we know there are people here from are Newberry, uh, Lived Religion in a Digital Age, I believe Rachel Lindsay is here, uh, the Glossy Matthew Project with Atria Larson, uh, who uh, both of those are SLU projects, and then with the University of Dayton, uh, Manita Cox and Jennifer Speed for the Dunbar Library and Archive that we'll get into later. Uh, so feel free to have side conversations in the chat. Uh, use the Q&A liberally. Uh, we have a time that we will get through and then uh, we will move in the direction that this group wants to. Obviously in the setup, it's not easy to do a, a round table, but uh, we'll do our best to get everything together. Our goals here today, we're gonna go through the challenges that we ran into and things that you should anticipate if you're trying to set up something similar. Uh, the advantages uh, that we all found by the things that we've done and, and specifically what we've done that has uh, created these opportunities for ourselves. Uh, the solutions that we found, the architecture that we're using, and then as I said, we'll go through the specific use cases and all of these will be uh, live examples that we'll be showing you. So uh, everything will work and there will be no problems. Uh, and then we're going to go into discussion and that may go a couple of different directions depending on uh, what the group wants. So the challenges that we have here uh, have been covered in some other uh, good presentations I've seen as well. There's interoperability standards uh, that don't quite match. There's resources that don't match. There's selectors that can be unknown. Uh, there's data accessibility issues. There are reference resources and dereferenceability of the individual pieces of data that we might be trying to access and then the learning curve for linked data. With interoperability, uh, there are things like activity streams, web annotation. Uh, there are very clear descriptions for how things are supposed to be interoperable, uh, but things don't always quite line up. When you start looking at the data objects that you're getting back, some of them use uh, an ID key, some use a URI, some use an at ID, and it all depends on specifically what you're working with. So you might have a piece of software, a really great web application or a module or uh, something that's you know, a, a, a React component that you just want to plug in and it doesn't quite work. Uh, and that can be very frustrating. Even within IIIF, moving from Prezi 2 to Prezi 3 changes the ways that uh, some things are handled. So uh, ranges and sequences mean things slightly differently. Uh, labels need to be handled a little bit differently. And that can cause uh, issues if you're trying to support things across all of those. Resources, if you're collecting them from places that uh, aren't all within your own repository, can also be very confusing. You can have uh, all these different uh, fixed vocabularies that describe things that 
feel like the same thing to a human and uh, to anyone reading a, a, a printed list of these things would say, oh yeah, I get that this is the 11th century. Um, but when you actually try to do something like a faceted search or show me all the things on this range or uh, animate a chronology across something, uh, it starts to really matter uh, exactly how these things are described. Selectors work the same way. There's a lot of different ways to cut pieces out of images of time, of 3D model. Uh, there's all kinds of targets that you may reach into that are uh, uh, PDFs, or maybe they're uh, uh, an RTF file or uh, somebody's TEI. All of these different things, the manifests and collections, um, are, are how IIIF has managed it. But that also creates this abstract resource, this container that exists outside of the resources you're actually trying to point to. And that means when you get into the uh, space of web annotation, you're starting to annotate something that uh, doesn't have meaning until it's filled as a container. It also means that if somebody else knows about the resource that you're trying to annotate, but you've annotated the manifest that contains that resource, it might be very difficult to discover uh, that somebody else has actually been working on it. Accessibility for the, the data is a mess. Uh, I promise we will get to some advantages, but uh, cores, HTTPS, mixed content, uh, all of the things around uh, accessibility uh, creates issues. There's a lot of anxiety, I think, just in the idea that a resource might go away. So linking your resources to somebody else's collection uh, feels fragile. Uh, and there's a lot of trust in this community uh, that, that has to be built up, um, but at the same time, we have to find ways around a lot of the issues that uh, tend to break every time there's a new major update for browsers or web security uh, and on and on. Referenced resources uh, comes down when you have URIs or IDs for things that you can't resolve, uh, that there's no way to actually get to it. Or you have a referenced resource, but what's referenced isn't a data object, but the uh, web view for that same object, uh, where something is, is almost pointed in the right direction. Uh, there have been resources that have uh, we've seen issues with where, um, say, a collection uh, enables HTTPS for all of their uh, URIs, so they change everything. But if they're not forwarding the requests from the HTTP request, uh, then you might have annotations that are pointing to a target that is now out of date, uh, even though they've that repository felt like they were doing something good by securing uh, their, uh, their uh, communications. That adds a lot of um, a lot of possibility of having unverifiable assertions where somebody has uh, added an annotation, but you can't tell what that annotation actually goes to. Finally, uh, with linked data, there's a definite learning curve that leaves a lot of people uh, frustrated. Uh, there's an enthusiasm when you learn about linked open usable data. Everybody wants to include it. I've seen it in all kinds of proposals, and it always winds up as a nice to have something that will get added in. Um, because even if you haven't done linked open data and you haven't put it all together, unless it's the focus of your project, uh, it, your stuff still works. <laughs> it may not be as useful to other people, but your stuff still works. Uh, but it really does affect your discoverability. If, if only the people who know specifically about your project can find it, uh, it starts to create issues. Uh, but that learning curve does uh, cause a lot of people not to take the last step. And we'll go over to Brian here. Let me unmute myself. You see the right screen? You see the advantages here? Yeah? Okay. So, yes, thank you, Patrick. It, it, it can be a little bit disheartening out there. I think any, anyone in science or research knows you, you're going to run into trouble when you're trying new things. I think that's sort of one of the beautiful main things to know about IIIF, it's, yeah, it's a standard, but it's a standard to try to represent this sort of open data in a usable way for everybody. Um, so I'll sort of be going through these one by one. I'll just say a little quick word. Um, yeah, you see data accessibility here again, because we want to talk about the good parts of having uh, an ecosystem of open data, right? So when what we expect when you're making data in the system is that I can always get to it. That's one of the base principles to know about. Uh, and it works 
out for places, especially like SLU, where we don't have a whole lot of content. What we would rather do are sort of unit tool, third-party annotation kind of tools around your content. And if your content's open data, it's fair game. Uh, more than fair game, you're hoping someone does something useful on top of it. Uh, it makes for an interesting community to get to work in. Um, so clear standards, triple IF, you have all the specifications, you know where your limits and your restrictions are. Uh, reusability, since you're following specifications, the data I have for a certain use case and solution may actually be almost immediately applicable to another solution. Uh, the community, this great community, everybody you've seen here, uh, I don't think I need to, to talk that up at all. Um, uh, reputation. So IIIF is uh, known now by a lot of institutions, even funding agencies. And so just saying, hey, getting to say something like, oh, hey, we're consortium members, uh, it, it, it helps uh, tease along certain processes when they know that we have this kind of backing. And then finally, extendability. So being able to bring in your own context through linked data for stuff, maybe like uh, geospatial data, uh, and just extend it right in. Um, if you had seen any of our talks previously went into that, I don't think we'll go quite too much into that here. So let's dig in a little more to data accessibility. So this isn't necessarily in terms of uh, accessibility features, although I will say something on that. Uh, a, something I've been told I do wrong, and I was told wrong by uh, the special needs community, is that as a developer, we do things like make usable or reusable components, right? But what if I make a component that puts a class on a div to make it act like a button? What that does is make the accessibility features built straight into the browsers no longer work. Um, that's something I wanted to bring up and something I know that I've learned and I'm trying to, to work into my thoughts as I develop unit tools um, that we don't want to get around browser standards. Uh, they're there for a reason. Uh, anyway, data accessibility. <laughs> uh, so when someone says my data is strip life compliant, they mean that like I'll find a wealth of tools that will work with it just for doing it this way. Uh, this improves discoverability, uh, accessibility, and often puts content out that makes it uh, available for free now, something that wasn't there before. To dive in a little bit to the clear standards, not just the specifications, but the documentations, the implement implementations, use cases, uh, all those things that, that go on around having standard specifications out there, uh, you know, implementations as in all the demos. Again, I get to bring that up because we've seen so many. Uh, use cases through like IIIF stories, even places like our IIIF cookbook. Uh, as far as finding out roadmaps, all of the community calls are public, all of the notes and agendas and minutes from those community calls are public, so you can always see what we're working on. Uh, and as far as extension goes, it's a little harder to just kind of talk about, you know, laissez-faire, but uh, it's easy to extend the, well, easy is the wrong word, it's, it's possible to extend the IIIF presentation API 3 for specific scenarios you might have. Reusability, so going back to linked open usable data, let's pretend uh, all of it is open access and all of it does resolve. Uh, that, makes, that makes it really easy to work with. Uh, so available software packages, viewers, tools for aggregating annotation exist and can be reused and shared. That's something we focus on a lot because as we make unit tools around annotation, and as you've seen throughout the conference, being able to have federated data amongst annotation and being able to work with other people's resources uh, keeps a bunch of content open to us. Uh, and we like that. So we make reusable modules and, share, and use shared libraries and shared unit tools. And that all works not only in our system, but in other people's systems they're making, whether we intend for it to or not, which uh, something I keep bringing up for sort of those uh, unnatural for free things, because we all do things kind of the same in the background. It's, it's fun to run into. So the community, where there's plenty of focused working groups. You can go pick what it is you want to focus on. There's manuscripts out there. Oh, here, I've got the Slack pulled up. Well, can I tell you about uh, AV, cookbooks, the GitHub, manuscripts, Maps, outreach, STEM, all those things. There's plenty of defined working groups you can come in and, and find peers for yourself. Uh, that's also where you meet um, lots of users who are trying to learn things and uh, where you find the collaboration where all of these people sort of in this sphere are willing to work with you, want to work with you, and are very accepting of both the things you are good and, and bad at. 
Uh, to dig into the reputation thing a little more, again, I'll bring up IIIF is known to partners and funders. Uh, and it's attractive because like we've talked about with encoding IIII, with IIIF and linked within data, it gives you access to data that either there was no access to before or that there wasn't sufficient access to before. All I could see was the list of things. I couldn't enhance that list of things. Uh, so sort of opportunities for scholarly contributions. Uh, it, 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 it makes it easier to work with other people, knowing that they do IIIF and you do IIIF uh, out there in the scholarly world, it, it means you'll, you'll, you'll land a partner easier. And that's that. Uh, extendability, so I'll just give um, a couple of examples. So things like nav date and nav place to do temporal and spatial dimensions and specifications. Uh, things like web annotation motivation. I know a lot in the geospatial sphere, we're looking for things like, oh, can I have a motivation of geolocate or georeference or warp or make this for thin plate spline processing? Uh, things that I might not necessarily understand, but I would know how to extend a motivation to allow for that value. Uh, and even like I brought before, GeoJSON LD, I won't go into it here, but it was something that was uh, not trivial, but possible to do to bring it into IIIF. Um, GeoJSON also has other things like uh, GeoJSON time and GeoJSON 3D and all kinds of other little tweaks. Ah, and as a bonus, so this came up a couple of times, and I'm going to say it again, like the, the ones where people are using manifests to, to, to render out web pages. So IIIF as a working document. Yes, sort of when we wrote the specifications and when we make the data, we sort of expect it to be, oh, it's the manifest, it's created, it's here, this is how it exists now. But what you see is a lot of people dynamically generate manifests on the fly and just sort of have like a data node in the background with the specific ID to let it do that so that it can aggregate and collect new information that's coming out of, around it, maybe even through things like linked data announcements. Uh, and it, it really gives you a chance to have like a standardized, shareable, accessible working document uh, in, in certain scenarios. And that was definitely a bonus. And seeing some of the use cases during the conference of how that's used, uh, it really brought that out for me. So we'll dive in and talk a little bit more about our setup and why this works. So like I talked about unit tools, standards in the background, what does that all mean? So we'll focus right here on uh, the REARM API and services. So what this is, is a centralized API, a uh, centralized set of services that full-blown apps or tools can talk to with a centralized database in the background and a centralized authentication uh, and attribution schema. Um, so that, that, that sort of helps with the common challenge of when we're making a dynamic application, how do we get from data collected from the user in the front end to stored in a database in the back end and back out? So having this centralized situation means once I've got it solved for one of my tools, it works with a lot of my other tools. And when we go into other views for other people's projects, if we can just kind of go back in into the hooks and have them point at us or wherever else their data is, we can just become a part of that process. Uh, so the centralized API has something on top of it called Tiny Things. So what Tiny Things is, is it's uh, a front end app. It, it, it lets you actually go in, example of it. it, lets you actually go in and see what it's like to work with an API. So if I wanna say like, oh, here, I just wanna make an object real quick. You can imagine in a web application, the very much more complicated views that can be done around this, but essentially there it is. I've hit my API, I hit the create endpoint, I stored that JSON, it's linked open data, we threw context on it, it's got a resolvable ID and it's usable because that ID will resolve. And we will make sure it resolves. Hooray, usable. Hello, everyone. So what Tiny Things sort of represents is the duality of how you have a centralized API. Uh, it, it exists through being talked through through front ends and proxies through applications themselves who have proxy calls into just the back end with the API. But actually having this just sort of deployed as a web app, we opened it up to cores. And what we realized is instead of making backends for each application, if we just had the centralized uh, proxy API open, I could just write fetches directly to that. And essentially I never have to write a backend for my application. Uh, now the way attribution works with Rearm, it's uh, you lose a little bit, 
doing it that way, but certainly for like proof of concept ideas, it makes it real easy to build those up real fast and shoot them out, um, which, you know, it helps with like things like faculty projects who come in and they maybe only have uh, enough money to get like one good interface going. Uh, so something very cool about that is it's replicable in your own system. So you could pull down a rerun and pull down a tiny things and then just have this going and running for yourself. And uh, sort of like a presentation we gave years ago, you can set up a centralized API or a working web application in 10 minutes or less. Uh, it makes it very flexible. It makes it very fast to work with. Again, I'm going to bring up that topic. Uh, so I'll go past and move on from that. So now, if you remember the view tools and, and, and systems, um, what does this look like sort of in a UI API scenario for different projects? And so what you'll see here are some of the things you've seen throughout the conference. Uh, the central API and rear services can talk to all of these things. So all of these interfaces use this, this same back end, and they're all able to use each other's data because we use linked open data. We follow the IIIF specifications. And also the output services. So the queries in the rear to output things like the annotations or the annotation lists, or even to sort of track targets back to content, uh, they all work in a linked open usable data sense. Um, so like this concept, I keep trying to frame it, this overall concept of, of, of working this way, working with standards, working with centralized logic, it's accommodating to tools and unit tools. And it's sort of why we, fell into this development style uh, just to be able to react as a small team, be able to react to the community with more than one project a year. <laughs> uh, yes, so focusing specifically on the rearm API. Come back into here. What we have published uh, is the documentation version of it. So here you can come through and read what all of our um, the uh, open hooks are, how to do updates and creates and how to pull data out, uh, different special things with some of our proprietary properties that you can use in the background, how we do our authentication. I'm not going to read through this. So you can do it on your own time. Just wanted to show you that's sort of our documentation version of it. Uh, the, oh, I didn't pull it up. Sort of initial front end of it, like I said, you want to come in and sign up. Uh, so you come in and you register through Auth0, you go through this, you say you are someone. Uh, hopefully I haven't used that one yet. So you sign up and that gives you a key that you can come back with. And now you assign this key to your application and now your application is attributed through that user you just made. Um, so sort of the idea for using Realm, since you know it's going to be an application, since you know you're going to have backend proxies with it, uh, you, you want to be able to attribute that it's yours and belongs to your application, right? So this is, I don't want to use your, your proxy that's only attributed to your proxy ID. I want my own and I want my own stuff. Uh, and this is sort of how we allow for that. So these get refreshed and uh, decoded in the background uh, through the Realm API, not in your app. And sort of that all gets handled for you. And if it's ever expired, uh, there's a special response to you return to your application to say, hey, just come back here and refresh it. Uh, what else we talking about? Uh, so there's version control in it. So as you make an object, so you saw me make that hello everyone object. If I were to update that to say goodbye everyone, what you would end up with are sort of versions. So no objects ever overwritten unless you choose to use the overwrite hook. Uh, a, a history of it is kept. So attributed to who it was here and then a change was made, might be a new attributor here. Uh, it, it, it allows for uh, sort of history control and version control of things. Because then at any point along those pipelines, you could go pick a node and release it, which says, hey, don't really go look at all those other ones. Throw this one out there. This is the one I intend to have released and I only want to show my released data. Uh, when it saves data, it's loud by default. You can save plain JSON. It doesn't have to be linked data JSON, but for at least the proprietary properties we put onto there, like you saw that under underscore rerum, we have a little context for that just so that out there in the wild when things have to be processed, they know a little bit about what to do with it. 
Uh, we also allow that trick in your headers where you can sort of apply a context through the way the HTTP request headers work. Um, that's a little way more too technical to talk about here, but it's sort of a way that you could trigger a switch to say, treat all my data like linked data, even though I don't have a context yet. Uh, oh, so here's just an example of all those hooks we have open. So you'll see, get my properties, get by, all, by ID, get some stuff about the history, create, release, patch, update, overwrite, set, unset, all the fun stuff you would imagine you could do as a sort of unit API actions. And those are all available, super fun. Uh, so what Deer is, and I'm, I'm, Deer is sort of, uh, if you're gonna be collecting information, oftentimes you see that done through forms. Um, and a lot of simple applications and proof of concepts people want right out of the door are just, how can I get it so I can collect data from people and then have that data and then show it back. And so we built a little bit of a framework around that. Um, it's sort of like, if you know how Bootstrap works for CSS, this kind of works for form elements in, in that kind of sense. Uh, you can put special attribute like things, uh, like views out there and say it's connected to this object. It'll go and fetch that object, draw that view for you automatically. It allows you to write your own custom templates in the background. Uh, so this just sort of serves as a, as a next level above tiny things. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, a data collection and then exhibition sort of machine just through simple forms so that you don't have to even write script in most cases. You just come in and do these uh, uh, HTML attributes, right? And it'll function for you. Now, I think that's where I hand it back over to Patrick. Yes. All right. Gotta get my Zoom back. Where's my mute? There. Okay. We're set. <laughs> that was fun. Okay. Uh, thank you. There, that's a lot of infrastructure. It's a lot of documentation. Uh, and the reason that we do that, uh, I mean, for here, we do it because we're about to talk about all the things we built on it. And that's what this session's about. We do that for ourselves as well. In the center, we've had six full-time developers uh, over the course of using this kind of model. Uh, we've had students come through, uh, interns. We've had uh, collaborators from other institutions. So it's important that we're able to hit people at different levels. So that DEER setup uh, deals a lot more with uh, what we can see uh, uh, somebody who's doing maybe web design and more comfortable with uh, something like Angular or Vue. Um, but using the RIRM API is, is a lot tougher, but we can then send somebody right to tiny things and say, create a couple of things and let's see what they visualize as. Uh, so what we're gonna go into now is talk about uh, TPEN, which is our oldest project. And it is the one that is uh, the, it's the least dependent on all the stuff that we've built because it was built before everything else. Uh, but we keep enhancing it to add in more and more to it. Uh, for reasons that will soon become very obvious. Uh, TPEN prefers to have IIIF assets, but it doesn't require them. Uh, that's why it, we say it's IIIF aware. Uh, it can export any project as a manifest, and it's a platform for integrating the new things that we're doing, uh, including things like uh, building up a, a new manifest from a, a folder of JPEGs or starting from a new IIIF manifest and creating a project based on that. Uh, TPEN is a transcription tool, and I've got that. All right, so uh, this is a, a sort of read-only interface. If you just jumped into TPEN, you had nothing else. You could throw in a manifest, uh, say load the transcription, and this is definitely going to work in real time. Let's see what happens. Fortunately, we don't have to wait for that. Yeah, try and keep uh, that. I was about to say. You think it's, it's going to pop in behind me? Um, so this is an example of a Walter J. Young notebook uh, that we have in our library at St. Louis University. It's hosted on OCLC, so there is a IIIF endpoint for it. Uh, in terms of uh, SLU, it's not a remote resource. It's something that SLU owns, and we built TPEN. Um, but from the context of the TPEN website, it is just a resource from the internet. So in this case, uh, uh, Susan Ganey has gone through and annotated all of these lines using TPEN. And each of the annotations on this uh, tie back to that original IIIF resource. So we're able to uh, do things with it that we 
uh, wouldn't be able to do if this was a completely closed proprietary system. Uh, this is a different version of that, uh, or a different project where uh, somebody has actually taken Jeff Goldblum's handwritten review of a, a Carly Simon record and uh, annotated the words instead. Uh, and this was because they were trying to get samples of handwriting and, and it was more important to have uh, those rectangles instead of the lines. Still sort of works within this, but you can imagine that that interface uh, would probably be better served uh, in a different interface, but able to create the same types of annotations. So we're already starting to extend this and say, if we can store these annotations in the same place, if we can standardize the way in which we're creating them, uh, then we can show them even in these different interfaces. So a T-Pen transcription interface that was built for lines can still show these annotations that are drawn as uh, just squares and rectangles uh, identifying word tokens instead. Uh, T-Pen manifest looks a lot like other manifests you might expect uh, and does all of the things that uh, you would expect to. In cases where we have images that have been uploaded, we actually create our own canvases and we, and we host local images, but where we can point to external images, uh, we prefer that. Sorry, here we go. Um, so paleography at uh, Newberry is a project that came out of TPEN uh, many years after. Uh, it used uh, rerum transcription for the annotations, and it was the first uh, time that we had actually taken the annotations of the transcription out of TPEN and stored them in the rerum database that we had created in, in the meantime. Uh, the paleography project uh, for French paleography was first designed and built uh, years ago on Drupal, and as Drupal upgraded, it became obvious that IIIF uh, collections were actually doing a lot of the work that we were trying to manage with Drupal. And so we've started migrating uh, the, the, the French site off of Drupal and the Italian site that's currently there. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you what those look like. And then uh, specifically, uh, we have a sort of uh, stripped down version that we can show you uh, that is uh, going to launch. And once it launches, it'll be mostly indistinguishable from the site that was there before. Uh, so I've stripped it down so that you can see specifically what's happening. Uh, and that what we're really dealing with is just manifests and collections, uh, all of these things through IIIF. So this is the French Renaissance paleography site uh, and uh, it's lovely. Uh, it's within Drupal right now, this one here. Uh, and I can go into uh, my transcriptions and I'll see projects that I've been working on and if I go into any of these, uh, it takes me into a, uh, an interface that is uh, a T-Pen version uh, specifically built for uh, this that actually loads from Drupal information uh, and then is tied into Rarum for its annotations. So it doesn't hit the main sort of T-Pen users database uh, as that goes. Oh, I should have picked one that didn't start on not align. Anyhow, so this is this is uh, what the interface looks like. It's a little bit different. Obviously, we've branded it for the, the specific Newberry project. Uh, Italian paleography also exists. Uh, it's a lot like French paleography, but for Italian. Uh, specifically, uh, the interfaces here were very different because we had different types of tools. There were different types of scripts that were being dealt with, and there were different things that the, the scholars and the curators wanted to communicate. Uh, so uh, this uh, gives you the opportunity to use the same types of interfaces for transcription, uh, but provide different tools and resources alongside them. This is an example of the, what is this? This is Italian. So these are the Italian manuscripts, and this is the collection that's hosted at the University of Toronto on behalf of uh, the Newberry Italian Paleography Project. And uh, what we've done here is loaded up the collection and had a, a collection viewer that looks like most people would expect it to look. Uh, and then we've been able to add additional filters through annotation on these objects uh, to add facets that, that weren't there or weren't explicit before uh, so that people can sort and, and view uh, the things within the collection uh, specific to what they want uh, to actually see. 
and then viewing on any one of these just opens up that particular manifest in a, a very stripped down viewer here. Uh, and you can see you have Mirador and underneath you're getting the metadata from those things. Uh, and then these are links that have been annotated onto it that go into uh, background essays for specific, uh, 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 so you can do self-guided study of this particular document, learn about the script, learn how to transcribe it. A sample transcription that uh, helps people uh, <laughs> compare what they've actually done to what is expected. And then direct catalog links back into the collection itself. The next project we have here is Glossing Matthew. Glossing Matthew took a uh, big advantage. Uh, it was done on a shoestring budget so far. Um, it has taken advantage of the uh, the deer and the rerum uh, projects that that Brian showed uh, specifically, in that we were able to start a collection immediately. Uh, it was just a matter of a, a couple of days before we had a portal that was spun up to allow people to. Um, do transcription on these uh, glosses. The idea of the project is that uh, you have chapters in Matthew that have been uh, glossed and had commentaries over, over time. A lot of these uh, glosses overlap. Transcribing those glosses and be, being able to ultimately make connections between them uh, is a very powerful way of experiencing uh, the, the gospel of Matthew and exploring the cultural and context of, of that, uh, uh, of the generation of these texts in the first place. Uh, so what it needed uh, that didn't exist yet was that project management portal. TPEN is used for transcription, uh, but this is a front end only project. All of the annotations that are being stored are being sent into that public endpoint that Brian showed you earlier. And so we're able to create uh, richer descriptions of things. Some of these resources are wonderfully uh, detailed IIIF resources. Uh, some of them are PDFs that we had to download and, and split apart and, and put together ourselves, um, but they're all able to be together in this uh, in this setup. So in Glossing Matthew, uh, there's a list of manuscripts here that's that's created dynamically. Uh, I have a separate session on that, so I won't get into it. Uh, and then individually on these, uh, we have annotations that we've attached. This is a, a deer form that annotates additional metadata that isn't in the catalog entry for this particular uh, IIIF manifest, uh, although some of it may be. Uh, but we can overwrite or we can supplement as we need to. And then there are two other projects within this uh, that have the marginal and interlinear glosses uh, for uh, these folios that are below. And you can go into any one of those. And you can see that there's transcription that's already been done. Uh, and ultimately, what we want to be able to do with this project is identify uh, sections of the transcription as, uh, as being uh, in different marginal locations and then connect those regions to each other. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, in a bracket gloss, the top left bracket may connect to the next page's top left bracket before it connects to any columns on that page. Uh, it's a very obvious thing for a human to understand. But to be able to look at all of these, uh, this collection of annotations and read it in a sensible order uh, is an important thing to uh, be able to do as a human. Uh, there's two quick ones that I'll show you here, uh, and they are just visualizers for manifests. We use them to test that things are, are working correctly, but we found that there's a lot of other uh, interesting little ways to experience them as well. This one is our reader at read.rerum.io. And uh, we've just put in one of our TPEN manifests here. And you can see the annotations on it. Uh, you can also, oops, I stuff in my way here. Uh, you can also view it just as the annotations themselves sliced up. And yeah, that's a good image. Um, and then there are uh, other ones of these that would be just as interesting. So here's one from uh, the Welcome Collection. This one's larger, I think it's like 500 pages. So I might, this might slog out on us. Here it is, there we go. Um, thanks memory. So this is, this is one that has been uh, automatically identified and we'll get back to this one in particular because there's a lot of interesting things you can do 
uh, with some of these longer ones as well. So these, these are annotations that are incoming. Uh, if I uh, made a change in the TPEN project to the TPEN one, uh, you would see it in this, uh, in this interface. And similarly, if somebody goes into the welcome collection and changes or corrects any of this OCR, it will be uh, corrected automatically because it's loading this from the manifest itself. Uh, so this TPEN manifest is the route book that I had showed you earlier. So we can jump into a page here uh, and we can see the same thing. So it becomes a, an easy way to share some of these. Uh, this type of thing uh, can be embedded. As a matter of fact, in the glossing project, I just showed you that sidebar that had uh, the image in it is just an embedded version of this. Uh, so it has a, a few extra um, uh, tricks that you can play with it as well. The AB is almost the exact same thing, except uh, instead of loading pages at a time, we've split everything up into annotations and we do uh, searches within it. So here's, uh, it goes off. Uh, this is all, all the annotations within that uh, short one. And I can say, show me things that uh, start with la, and there's two of them. Or I can say, find all that have la in them. As I type, it will show me just what it is that I'm looking for. Uh, in this music one, it's not as useful. Uh, but if you go back to the uh, Jeff Goldblum example, which I think is what it's about to load here. 1006, maybe not. This, this might be, yeah. This is what everyone wasn't working before. We're running our servers into the ground right now. All right, here's the welcome collection instead. This is going to be uh, uh, much better because welcome collections are very well hosted, um, and we are not. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, this is all those annotations too, which is a it's an amazing mess right now. Uh, but if I wanted to see, for example, uh, places where uh, health was included, I could then see all of the references to health within it. Uh, and then each of these has uh, tucked within it the reference specifically to that canvas that has the identity and the slice of that canvas as well. So if you wanted to go back directly to it, uh, you could examine it in place uh, and do all of those things as well. Uh, this gets particularly interesting and in, uh, concordance. And I'm just going to skip over to this. Uh, so here's the exact same document, the exact same manifest loaded into our concordance tool which is just another way of visualizing this manifest. Uh, I can set a minimum word length and minimum word occurrence, and then I get the same type of search here. I can type in health, uh, and I see now all of these examples that have health in them, and I can pull them up here. Or I can look at them individually. And this becomes very useful if you are uh, looking for uh, maybe how Jeff Goldblum uh, writes his A's. You can start to look at the uh, comparisons, one between the other, or words that may be used more often. Uh, so this takes us to the Dunbar Library and Archive. Uh, and they have a very interesting project. Uh, it is uh, in its nascent stage right now. So you're, you're seeing a lot of uh, conceptual stuff, um, but you'll be very excited when we get the final presentation when this is done, uh, let's say two years from now. Uh, the way in which they're bringing together collections is an amazing amount of work. They're finding things all over the place. Here's an example where they've created something that uh, exists in the University of Dayton uh, eCommons, which is on the, the B Press digital commons platform. Uh, and it does everything that a lot of uh, uh, DAM systems do. You, you get access to those things and they're saved and they have metadata associated with them. Um, but because these poems that combine performances uh, and also uh, references to things like the uh, uh, glossary of dialect terms, it starts to get very difficult to represent it the way that you want to because it 
you have to shoehorn it into this uh, very library built collection system. But we're able to access these things within the collection and bring them out into other interfaces and combine them with other web annotation and then IIIF resources as well. Another uh, DSpace is another one of these similar uh, products. And at the University of Delaware, they have correspondence between Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Alice, his wife. And there are a bunch of letters. And uh, this is also something that if you spend time looking at these things, it's very easy to get into. You recognize it, um, but you don't necessarily know from reading any of these what they link to or what they're connected to else in Paul Dunbar's life. In addition to these, there are resources across all different sorts of uh, 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 history projects at public and private libraries, at universities. Uh, as, a, as a poet and poet laureate, there's a lot of official records uh, that relate to him. Um, but there's also a lot of things as an African-American poet where he's collected in places that uh, other people aren't. Uh, so instead of having a uh, Paul Dunbar collection that's very easy to find, he might be collected in a group of uh, early African-American poets. Uh, and that makes it harder to curate the collection just for him and for his family and the, the, uh, those who are in orbit around him. Uh, even places like the, uh, the park system have the house that his mother lived in and an exhibit in there that they would like to be able to connect to this library and archive. So we created, uh, we've created so far uh, a very similar portal to the Glossy Matthew portal uh, to allow for the transcription of these letters at Delaware. And so what we're doing is adding annotations to all of these things and creating a preview uh, that gives us the same type of uh, uh, layout. Now we have annotations that are connected to the, uh, the image itself. But the image is still at Delaware and the annotations now are in Rerum. And as we continue to make annotations to link those back to records uh, in the uh, e-commons, we can bring those in from the University of uh, Dayton and uh, Delaware retains access to theirs. And we're creating the links between them with Rerum. So as we start to bring in things like the typewriter that he was using or uh, the cane that he was walking with or a photograph of him at the place that's mentioned in this letter, uh, we can tie those into an exhibit uh, without having to gather them all together in one physical space. That is the goal of IIIF, but in this case, we have both IIIF and very not IIIF resources that we need to bring together. This takes us to uh, lived religion in the digital age. Uh, this is probably the least IIIF uh, that we have in here, but it was a project that we were only able to tackle because we had already built this ecosystem out for the IIIF projects that we had. Uh, the, there are geographic annotations that will uh, themselves become much more IIIF as Brian is in the maps group and dragging that stuff in. Uh, and there's many uh, different types of main objects. So it's a collection that includes uh, experiences that people have in various sacred sites uh, around St. Louis in this case, uh, but also includes the objects that they find there, which could become IIIF objects, uh, uh, images, statues, uh, the experiences that they have there, songs and performances that they've seen, senses, the people who are involved, the entities, the buildings, the organizations that operate those buildings. So we're trying to create a system that can uh, allow people to walk through those types of spaces that includes uh, IIIF resources and not and map those relationships. But fortunately, we already had Deer to create a lot of those data entry forms and we had Rerum to store the annotations and the relationships and the assertions that people are making about those. Uh, so religioninplace.org, uh, if you're interested, is a great place to go. Uh, it's, an, it's an outstanding project, and they're not only looking for sacred sites uh, in St. Louis, but they are, have been working uh, specifically with fellows to extend this to uh, other spaces, other cities in the United States, uh, and certainly beyond. Um, so. If, if, it's, if that's in your wheelhouse at all, I, I invite you to take a look at this website. Uh, if we go into the data entry uh, profile that, we, that we've created uh, for them, let me pull up a location, probably be the best thing to do here. So here's locations that they've put in here. Uh, we'll grab a uh, Crave Coffee House. Um, so they have the opportunity here to give it a label to give it uh, mapping information to identify where it is in the world. They can say what type of thing it is. 
uh, and add all of this metadata to it. But what they're creating isn't a, a catalog record the way that uh, you would sort of traditionally imagine it. Uh, they're creating an entity that stands in for the Crave Coffee House, and then the label and all of the assertions that whatever researcher is adding this particular record uh, are being attached as annotations to it. They're descriptive annotations that we can resolve when we want to load that thing into the collection. Uh, that allows us to do things like add other assertions without breaking things later. Uh, let's refresh. I think our, I think our rare is, is choking right now. There we go. Um, oh, nope, I just got a notice. Memory of my computer is low from having 40 tabs open. Uh, <laughs> so here's an example of their locations. And just by having those annotations, we now can find all of those things uh, in these places. There's the Crave Coffee House. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to have this type of navigation tool. But as these annotations uh, only start with this, but then link back to an entire resource, uh, we could also have properties on this resource that would change the colors or shape or behavior of these, uh, these points as well, if we wanted to group them or filter them in different ways. Uh, and if we attach any sort of IIIF resource to them, uh, that also becomes something that we can view uh, in the, the views that we've attached to it. Oh, I, didn't, I hadn't pulled up another one. That goes back to Brian. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. You can share your screen again. So we're going to break out from some of those faculty projects and just go into the last couple of tools here. Uh, and while you see Rearm Geolocator and LRDA on the same page, it is worth knowing that LRDA is the reason I started doing geo stuff in IIIF at all. Um, so you can see sort of how we try to manage those kinds of relationships across the spectrum. LRDA was the first one that came to me with a component of, hey, you know, we just want to put in the coordinates for these places. And I was like, cool, that should be easy. And uh, here I am a year and a half later, still working on those standards. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's a wild world out there. So thank you, LRDA. You are why I am a IIIF MAPS co-chair. And if you didn't know, now you do. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and talk about reform. So what we've shown you is the different ways you can pass around the same sort of IIIF object and work with the content inside of it. The other thing that IIIF does for you is it allows you to build structure around those contents. And you don't need content to build structure. You just use other resource types to include the resource types that have content and then you can do that recursively, essentially, which lets you build any sort of structure or table of content you want. Uh, so of course, in our minds, we think that is a unit tool. I should be able to go into a piece of software with any IIIF Prezi 3 manifest and start to put structure on it. Uh, that's out, and I believe I have it open. So here, for example, I came in with a test manifest. Uh, yeah, so here you can see the structures and how it's uh, ranged together, and there's actually two different table of contents in here. And if you didn't know you could do choice like that, you can. Uh, so I am using this to test the app to see, okay, well, can I offer choice? Yeah, sure enough, I can offer choice. And when they click on this, I know which one to load. They click this one. Great. What this represents is sort of like a book, right? So imagine all you've done is gotten your content in, all you've done is gotten your canvases in, but now you want to say, hey, this is structured like a book, something that has like section one chapter one with page one, and then there's my resources on it, which are probably some psychedelic cats. Oh, good, I can't even open it. Good, good, good. Uh, so that's sort of the idea, right? And so now I can do stuff like actually page one and page two belong group. Oh, this is why it's a test. <laughs> I could do things when it will work. Uh, it does not yet. Like grab these two chapters and merge them together and call them section one ahead of time, or pull, pull pages out of other chapters and put them into different chapters, or do one that's like, this is the official when you buy the book from the store, it's like this, but then do a choice one that says, now, if you actually want it to be in timeline order, you do it this way. Uh, so the sort of idea is come in with the manifest, that should be triple IF content, not manifest. I'll work on it, content API people. Uh, and you come in and just go. So either this manifest is already in Rerum and I can update the manifest directly, or we could just do a sort of third party structural implementation for that manifest and link back to it. Uh, again, going back to that federated data structure, using the same data object everywhere, it works real great for this. Uh, something I'm struggling with now is dealing with 
collections. So what this does, you see, is it lets you do a structural organization around a manifest. And I'm wondering if that applies to collections too, or is collection management in that way, maybe its own thing separate from organizing a manifest. It's sort of a, a meta philosophical and technical question I haven't quite approached yet because I haven't started doing collections in this yet. Patrick does more work with collections, so I'll let him do all the work and then tell me. Hooray for teamwork. Bounce back into here. Uh, so that's a little bit about reform. And now the thing that I've been showing off for the last two days uh, is the rearm geolocator. So what I want to talk, uh, talk to it as today is a unit tool. Uh, and sort of since I've been showing it off, uh, I, I think it'd be fun to talk about it as a unit tool. What, what this actually turned into me for was I did it with LRDA first, and then I went, boy, that seems like a real standard way to do this. Can I pop out that module and make it a tool so that when the next project comes in and goes, oh, man, we really like that web map thing, we can go, wow, that's going to take two months, and you know, you're going to have to pay this much money, and, but really, I could just do it overnight real quick. <laughs> we're not that mean. This is why projects are cheaper with us. We tell you up front, that's what we're going to do. Uh, so here, it just lives as its own little tool. I can, in the background, decide which uh, databases to target and which projects to filter for. So essentially, I can just copy and paste this module into every web app that wants to have this interface. Uh, so of course, that meant being able to, uh, I won't brag yet, being able to support other things like bringing in triple life content through uh, the content API. So this is what the parameter is supposed to look like. And what you'll see here is this is actually the uh, geo extension thing I'm working on. So this actually processed nav place, which is cool. Uh, and I can do, oh, nope. And the other thing I wanted to show is since JSON is very, very serializable, and that might be a big word. Basically, it means if it's represented as JSON with key value pairs, I can do stuff like flip that into RDF or flip that into certain markup languages, things like HTML, or what you see here is MapML. Uh, so what this is, and I won't go too deep, it's just uh, instead of doing a bunch of script and including a leaflet viewer and doing all of that, you just put one HTML item on your page called a map. And then this does all the work for you in the background. You feed your features into it. You set what base map you want to use. And in particular, what they're doing really cool with this language is you can switch out the coordinate system you're using. So you don't have to use WGS84. Uh, it's very interesting, and it was very interesting how easy that just worked with the same principles of, well, if I'm just passing JSON around and I get to this, and all this is are just HTML representations of features, I could parse that JSON into a feature and just feed it, and it was just, it just kind of worked. Uh, that's just, like I said, some of the unnatural things that are so similar in the background that just work for you are very surprising sometimes, and this is a great example of why you want to do stuff like follow standards, follow specifications, try to stick to, to, to a certain type of encoding that you know you and your peers are doing, right? Because these MapML people who I were, was not peers for, I became an implementer for overnight just because it worked this way. And so now I go to those meetings and talk to them and tell them you should be a little better about dynamic features and all that fun stuff. So I would just like to show it again. This is my little unit tool for doing web maps, which I, I just think it's really fun to talk to people about it this way. It, it really is a, a lower barrier into some of these things than you think. Uh, yes, and I think that's about all I have for you because this goes back to the last thing that we have Patrick. for you uh, before we get into our free time is a uh, rare inbox, which was actually inspired by uh, a presentation at Triple IF. Uh, saw some people talking about, hey, this seems like a good idea. Uh, so that doesn't technically seem that difficult. Why can't everybody use it? Uh, so we made something that everybody can use. The idea is that there are uh, a lot of things that uh, get annotated, and there's a certain point where there's a, a human activity that needs to happen, right? People do this in real life. They, they publish a book or they tweet something. Uh, they, they give a presentation at a conference. Uh, so these are human-driven announcements uh, that decorate other resources. There's a specific Mirador plugin uh, that uh, will show you a little GIF of it working if you haven't seen it. Uh, and it, it allows you to do things uh, that uh, put more milestones than, than you may have. If you're working on a TPEN project, uh, you certainly get updates every time something's saved. And I can go back and look at your frequency of, of saving and have a sense of how your work was. But that doesn't give me the idea of you 
uh, laying claim to a manuscript and saying that you're starting a project or uh, saying I finished this project or this project's ready for proofreading. And that's where linked data notification comes in. Uh, basically, there's an announcement object that gets thrown into a big box and somebody can ask and say, does anything in this box refer to the thing that I'm looking at? Uh, that's the simplified view, but it's also a very simple thing. Uh, so we have a, a website that visualizes some of these, but this is what it looks like basically. Uh, you have an announcement that says, I am providing something, a supplemental information for some resource. Uh, it has the, the person who created it and any rights that are associated with it. And then if you want to include that supplement when you're viewing what you're viewing, uh, you can have it. Uh, these could also be used, in this case, it's being used for Mirador, but it could also be used within TPEN, for example, if we wanted. Uh, we could let people announce if they're working on something and say, these are my notifications. And uh, then if you start a project on that same resource, maybe you would be able to see, here's other people who have announced that they're also working on it if you'd like to collaborate with them uh, or race them or whatever. Uh, it could even be used for things like repositories to offer feedback to say, uh, hey, I have something for you. I've created this table of contents for your underdescribed resource, and I think you should take it. Uh, or I keep running into this error when I try to access these certain things. Or whenever I use your IIIF manifest, I find that it's non-compliant and here's why. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to use linked data notification for different things. In this case, the inbox is uh, completely agnostic to any of those. Uh, you're, you're free to do whatever you want with it. So, so, yeah. so here's a rare inbox uh, and all of these links are in that uh, thing at the top of the chat uh, and you'll be able to see all that later. Uh, and the idea is that there are simple specifications uh, to get to the interesting scholarly uh, content. You can actually create a, an announcement right on the page if you want, uh, if you just want to try something out. Uh, you can uh, uh, drag and drop triple IF even uh, here if you want and say, is there anything that announces to this? Obviously, there's we don't have 100% coverage of manuscripts in the world. Uh, so it's unlikely that something would just pop in, but uh, it could, you don't know. Uh, and so then we have the, the details here. We have specifications that specifically go through what we expect it to look like, how you would include a service block in your manifest. If you want to specifically say, use a particular uh, link data notification inbox, uh, we're happy to let you use Rarum if you want. Uh, and then the, the payload just has the object that you are trying to attach to something and the target that you're attaching it to. Uh, it's, it really is as simple as that. And then the idea is that somebody will put it together and say, uh, I'm going to see what do I have here. There it is. Uh, so if you load it up in Mirador, it'll give you a notification that somebody has some kind of supplemental information available for it. Uh, you'll get a pop-up, you can select from whatever's available, say, please include this. In this case, it's a table of contents. And now there's a clear table of contents uh, in Mirador, and it's just added that, supplemented the data object that was already there. Uh, we've also added support within this plugin for transcription data and uh, a couple of other things with ranges. I don't remember everything. And it's also something that Jeffrey Witt continues to work on, uh, and he has a, a Mirador 3 plugin as well uh, that is mostly functional. So uh, there, are, there are opportunities for all kinds of things there. Just wanted to show it because it's something that exists uh, at the fringe of our ecosystem, um, but becomes a really important thing as we keep talking about uh, content state and discovery and accessibility for all of these various resources. So. Uh, there is a poll on there in, in Whova if you uh, can go to it, or you can just throw things into the chat or shout them out loud, uh, do whatever you like. I will um, answer the questions while you hopefully go through those. Uh, our thought now is that we can go in a couple of directions. Uh, we can dig into one of the use cases that we presented to you if you want to see more about one of the projects that we have there. Uh, we have a, a slide here on our future plans if you want to know kind of what can we build once we've put this together? Uh, or if one of you have a particular resource or use case that you'd like to uh, present, we can uh, spend five or six minutes going into uh, 
how we would approach uh, dealing with uh, that collection or that project. Let's see if I go into questions here. Inbox seems similar to events. Are they fast enough to create interactivity between resources? Uh, that's a really good point. Uh, inbox is uh, similar to events. Uh, the difference is that it's not an event handler, it's an announcement. Uh, specifically, it's that's the type of thing that it is. Uh, linked data notification announcement and activity streams. Uh, so it is fast enough that you could create uh, interactivity between resources, but you would create a lot of, uh, there's a lot of overhead that you don't need there. Uh, it, it wouldn't be used to replace events. The idea of linked data notification is that uh, you're announcing something that is important enough that it's not constant uh, and, and that the, the numbers stay lower because of that. Um, you could certainly try to use Inbox for it if you like, um, but I, I would probably find a, an event handler instead. Um, as far as interactivity on a uh, sort of paleography scale, uh, it, it could certainly do that. Uh, if, I was, if I was typing on a page and you were typing on a page, it wouldn't give you that you know, real-time Google Doc experience um, but it certainly could give you the sense that somebody is, uh, working on a project has, has passed some threshold, you know, has upgraded the status of uh, this document from, you know, working to completed, and that means you can go in and start your proofreading. Uh, so you could do some workflow management, but I wouldn't say it would be kind of real-time interactive. Does that cover that question? Yes, it does. All right. Um, well, I don't see how to get the answers to the polls. Even though I know. Sense. Here's what I did is I answered it. <laughs> I answered That's it, awesome. and now I can see the answers. Yeah. Yep. That's really funny. Yep. All right. Plans, yep. plans for the future so far, but there's very few responses. Let's look in our chats here. Uh, yeah, IIIF notifications is tantalizing. <laughs> uh, it, one of the hardest things goes back to, I think, uh, selectors and, and IDs. Uh, you can imagine if you had something that was watching for announcements or notifications and doing something with it, uh, if I put an annotation on a canvas, I'm targeting that canvas. So whatever's watching for those announcements, if it's watching for announcements on that manifest, would also have to be watching for announcements on all of the things within that manifest. Uh, and there's a lot of things in a manifest, uh, and that gets even bigger once you have a, a collection, um, right? In a manifest, I may be targeting a canvas, I may be targeting an annotation list, uh, I may be targeting uh, one of the bits of text within an annotation. There could be an annotation within one of those annotation lists that I'm adding a tag to, or adding a, a you know an entity lookup to. Um, so it gets it gets messy very quickly. And I do like that you brought up events because something we've been looking at are sort of those message queues systems, right? Where things like that are messages are actually events that pile up that happen in things across our apps that need some processing and rear them. Um, and so there are certainly some analogies to that with the inbox, but like Patrick said, they are announcements. So that has a spec itself around them, which is why they don't quite work the same as a message queue system. Uh, but certainly a message queue system somewhere in there, like between tiny things and actually hitting services and databases. Um, we, we, have, we have looked into that logic. It, it, it's something that does make a lot of sense for this sort of ecosystem setup. But we don't have enough to actually give you a real good answer about it. Yeah, and internally, it makes a lot more sense. Uh, I've, I have sat at the table with Hypothesis folks specifically talking about these types of things. Um, the, they've done a ton of work on identifying the kinds of documents that you want to attach things to and specifically how to put annotations on them. Um, so that's great. Uh, we, we, there's actually a, a, you know, their conference I annotate is happening right now. So uh, I've bounced back and forth between those a bit uh, as well, uh, as much as I love everybody here. Um, I, I think that Hypothesis is definitely the, the person who's out in front right now. That's, that's the organization that is uh, setting a lot of the standards by default. And so what we're interested in doing is trying to say, how can we integrate these standards and reduce the initial work that we have to do to get a project running? Uh, so Brian, if you wanna talk about Sandbox.
Oh, unless are you muted right now? Or he, he can't even find himself. There you go. I'm muted. I'm muted. It's my, it's my, 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 my bad. <laughs> Um, I did see something in the poll about federation and you had a question mark around that. Uh, so sort of what I mean by data federation is that there's data stored in uh, a heterogeneous set of <laughs> autonomous data uh, and it's made accessible to consumers as one integrated data store with on demand data integration kind of thing. So you can imagine sister deployments of rerum sort of even as those back end proxies uh, that all work to push and pull and share data from different places, but through the same corpus. And that's sort of what we mean by federated data. It, it, it's out there and you're within this system that automatically makes it accessible to all the others. It's a particular sort of schema you see a lot in linked open data. Uh, what did you want me to talk about? Oh, sandbox. Uh, where, where, where? Right, so the rear and playground, it's the idea of the tab tour you just saw today but like that's all just in a web app. So we don't have to do the tab tour and destroy memory on our machines. That's sort of the idea behind it. Uh, it's, it's something I have in my mind to start working on, especially now as I've gone through all this triple IF stuff and, and did this geo, geospatial things, I'm thinking, you know, it would only take me like five minutes to get that little module in as an accessible piece of the playground. Um, and that's sort of what I'm thinking about with the sandbox, come in with a manifest, come in with an annotation, come in with the canvas, and go through all those tools and do what you want. And then at the end, either leave it attributed to the sandbox or sign up for Rearm and attribute it to you. Um, that's sort of the idea is just to be able to get through a workflow of, of little unit tools to try to tease out what you might need to do in your application and then sort of pop it out as a module for you. As much as possible, we the more we can make things accessible for anybody else to come in and use, then the easier it is for us to use it ourselves. Uh, what we've shown you here is what works in progress look like, right? You've walked through the door and seen everything spread out. Um, so this is our this is our sort of uh, roadmap for the future. What we're looking forward to, moving from that playground into a room collection management system. Thinking about things like uh, you know Omeka and Zotero that people use to create collections. Um, but what happens if you want to do more with it? What happens if it uh, is something that once you have that, you, you want to create your own interface for? Uh, so you get that opportunity. Uh, we, we want to include services that are focused on IIIF much more than they are now within Rarum, uh, so that some of the things can happen where you can annotate a target that is within a manifest, for example, and will automatically create the annotation that says that something else was created that targets that manifest. Uh, on your behalf, because web annotation needs to have as many annotations as possible. Lots of targets, lots of bodies. Uh, the transcription tool you saw uh, predated most of what we've done, and it's time for us to iterate up a version and uh, and put it together in a way that makes sense with IIIF. Uh, we've already experimented with including Open Sea Dragon uh, uh, within it so that you can zoom in on all the individuals. You've seen that we have it in Rarum. Uh, all of those things being put together, uh, creating a next level transcription annotation interfaces and getting to the point where it's very easy to say, I have poetry or I have music or I have a scroll or I have right to left text and I want to be able to transcribe it the same way with all the defense services, but I need a special interface. And then we've talked about all the, the various tools that we used and we wanna keep building those out as well. Um, that's our goal. So keep watching this space. And when we come back again, we're going to have many more furnished and polished projects to show you. Thank you both. Um, that takes us right up to, uh, yeah, the time on our session, but um, that's been an amazing walk through a really serious ecosystem and constellation of, uh, of tools. Um, so I'll just end by saying uh, thank you, Brian and Patrick. Thank you folks for joining us um, at the session today. Um, I'm going to, close off the recording, but we have a few more things today and then uh, another set of sessions tomorrow. So thanks folks and hope to see you uh, at some of those other sessions. Take care. Yep. Thanks everyone.